Hello everyone and welcome to the next episode of the Belinda Car Show. Today we're talking about the hottest topic in construction right now, 3D concrete printing. What is this the fourth or fifth concrete printing company you've talked to? I think so. I lost count. I mean, you, you've spoken with a lot of them. We haven't done podcasts on them all, but I mean, we started with Black Buffalo. But then we also talked about, last week we talked about space architecture, but there was a little hint of 3D concrete printing in that podcast. Yes, Saga is one of the companies that's, they're partnering with Cobot, uh, who's like right down the road from them in Copenhagen. So they have access to that and um, they're exploring what the technology can do. Yes, yeah, so Saga is more on the design, de design exploration side, similar to 20 Additive Manufacturing in Canada, who we visited last year, I think in November. We, they invited us to their factory. Do you remember where? In Proctor, British Columbia, right? I was going to say Calgary, but I was way off. Yeah, that was a long drive out there to Proctor. Through the snow. Yeah, so they are more on the design exploration side too, but they are in touch with the different nozzle head designers around the world. People, there are people in the Netherlands, there are people in Germany as well, designing all these specialized nozzle heads with different um, configurations. Whenever we were in Canada and talking to Ian of 20 Additive Manufacturing, he kept talking about what, the ways that they were exploring with different, different nozzle heads and how thin they could print each layer and uh, then it depended on what mortar what material they used and so there's a there's a lot of technical stuff uh, that goes on from the arm into the actual print well i think that the two types of concrete mix one is called k1 k for component because it started in germany but that is a simple nozzle head design all you're doing is just mixing concrete with water, or not even concrete, mortar with water, and then pumping it through the nozzle. And that nozzle is literally just a funnel, like a cone, right? Yes, it is. It's kind of like uh, baking. After you bake a cake, when you decorate it, you have di different nozzles that you can put onto your piping bag to d create different designs. So that's basically what it is. But then there is a more specialized nozzle head design for a K2 concrete mix. And the difference is that in that K2 mix, you are mixing the water and the motor right before it is pumped because there's a lot more accelerants in the K2 mix, so it hardens faster. You don't want to add the water before and then pump it through the, through the pipes and then, then start squirting it onto your, onto your design because it's going to harden by then. So a similar comparison, now correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like spray foam is like the K2 component wherever it, they, right before it's sprayed, the components come together. And uh, then for the K1, it would be more like an epoxy where you mix the two initially and then you apply. That's an excellent comparison. Good job. <laughs> I just thought that up myself. So earlier this week, I spoke to a company in the Netherlands that's not only creating specialized machine parts, but is also experimenting in 3D printed concrete designs. So today we have Volker Rutinga, CEO of Vertico 3D Printing, who is in the Netherlands. Nice to meet you, Volker. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your background, how you got into 3D printing and why you decided to set up base in Eindhoven. Okay. Uh, that's a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, I got into 3D printing um, in approximately, I think, 2014, because the company I was working for at the time, um, I was responsible for a large uh, machine project. We were installing a new press line in an automotive company, and I'm a visual person, so I wanted to have a scale model. Um, but even though there was a 20 million euro budget, there was no money for a scale model because that's how things work. So I decided to buy a 3D printer myself and see if I could make the scale model, right? Because I, I, I didn't know what the machine would, would, would look like and I wanted to have that physically in front of me. So um, I had no technical background and no experience with 3D modeling. Um, so at first it took me about a year to learn how to 3D model in SketchUp. 
and then try to translate that to a small plastic 3D printer and uh, an Ultimaker, one of the Dutch 3D printing brands. Um, so that took me a while, but I got it done. So I had my little scale model. And um, the first time I 3D printed something, I was so ecstatic. I thought it was so cool um, because I was, I was able to create something with a machine all by myself. Yeah. So that seems trivial now that I, now that I make and, and sell large machines. But at the time, for me, that was amazing to be able to machine something by myself. Um, and then so, see it come yeah, to it was, reality. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And from 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 start to finish. Right. Yeah. In my in my from my perspective. So um, that's how I started. And then I did a lot of 3D printing projects inside the company that I worked for at the time, as many as I could to improve the operations of the um, production lines in the automotive plant. And uh, after a while, a couple of companies in my town um, construction firm asked us to have one of our robots to experiment with for concrete 3D printing. And I was able to give them a robot from one of our spare parts um, halls. But I said, let me stay involved because I know a lot about 3D printing. And that's sort of how the ball got rolling. And after about a year, we um, could print something. And I decided to quit my job and start a company in this. That was about four and years was, ago, right? Yes, about four years ago. And at least starting the company was about four years ago. And at the time we were in the north of Holland and we decided to move to the south of Holland to Eindhoven for several reasons. First of all, there's more universities here and I needed students and interns to be part of my company, right? Um, and the University of Eindhoven is one of the front runners in 3D concrete printing. And there's another competitor slash colleague here as well that does very large scale printing in the Netherlands as well. Um, a firm by the name of Weber Bayemix, who has done a couple of bridges, which you will know from the 3D concrete printing, uh, whatever, internet searches. Um, and, and he's my into concrete 3D printing? From here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, that's why. I <laughs> Is he into concrete or steel 3D printing? Of bridges no this the the steel company here in holland is in the north in amsterdam so here these are 3d concrete printing concrete companies. companies okay so that makes eindhoven somewhat of the capital for 3d concrete printing right there's there's two companies here and there's one university which is front runner so there's quite a lot of concentrated knowledge on the subjects is there um, an effort by the local governments to actually market the city as a hub for 3d printing um, is that something you are trying to achieve? Yeah, well, no. So um, the, the the city I'm in now is inside the Netherlands. It's a tech hub. So for years, it's been trying to uh, promote itself as a tech hub because um, it was original or one of the companies that made the, the city uh, large is Philips. Philips, yes. Yeah, Philips that. started here, right? So um, the robots we use are are from a from a from a spin-off of Philips and and most of the people that work in Eindhoven have either worked for Philips or know someone that works for Philips. And you have ASML here as well, which is a large chips manufacturer. So these are very, very large technical companies. And so there's a lot of engineering here in the city. Um, and the municipalities promote the technical aspects here in the city strongly. Um, but the promotion of 3D printing is more mm, national. Okay. Uh, because it's just a promotion of innovation. So we were able to benefit a lot from good government programs for innovation and, 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 and tax cuts if you're innovating and stuff like that. So when you team up with the universities, are they helping you with like material research too? No, you'd think so. Um, but the material research for us, uh, the partners we use are generally the large manufacturing firms themselves. So we work a lot with Sika, but you have Heidelberg here as well, which we work with, and Weber is here in the city. So the material research we don't, because material research is quite laborious and difficult. So if you task a university to do material research, they generally want a somewhat longer term commitment, um, also financially, which we're not able to provide. So when we team up with universities, it's generally because they have an interesting project or an interesting design um, or a consortium, which we can then be part of. Um, and inside that consortium, sometimes there's some material research. Okay. So yeah. I was looking through your projects and your technology on your website, and it seems like y'all use a robot arm rather than a gantry system. Is that because most of your projects are on a smaller scale right now? So when we started in concrete printing, um, there, the whole industry was still trying to find out 
how to What's get started use? yeah right and 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 we we had a ro we had a robot arm that's how we started because i was you know from the automotive and the um, um so we started with the robot arm but i actually also helped um start uh some there was a gantry producing company here in the netherlands that it that installed a machine at the technical university of eindhoven and one in australia that i was involved with also um but we had a robot going and uh we continued on with the robot because it's a, a smaller scale machine. So you also, it's quite capital intensive to buy a gantry to start with. And as you know, it was just me starting the company alone um, with, with, with friends. I didn't have the capital to get a gantry machine at all. So we developed robotics. Now that turns out to be uh, a, a, a luck for us as well that we specialized in robotics because I, what I want to make is not housing, is more design and architecture. So I think that the aesthetic potential of 3D concrete printing is extremely high. And we are one of the few companies in the business that are focusing on that. So many people are focusing on housing. And in my opinion, a gantry, the, the only real advantage of a gantry over a robot is the size. Yeah. So um, a robot just has a limit of how big you can make things. And anything above that, you go to a gantry. So when you're talking about a house, a robot is possible if you do prefab elements and bring them on site or bring the robot on site and print individual elements. But if you want to go above a certain size, you have to go gantry. So you touched briefly on your, the focus of your company. You said architecture and design or art and design. Sure. So um, I like I started in 3D printing in plastics as well, because that's what I knew. Um, so we actually developed a plastic, a, a machine that pr printed with recycled household plastics, but there were already a lot of printers out there in plastics. And I think plastics right now has, has got a bad rep. You know, it's, yeah. it's not a very popular material, especially in terms of sustainability. Um, and concrete has just had more potential and it, and it has, it's a very good material for architecture and I enjoy architecture a lot. So it was a good combination for me from the technique. Um, so our company focuses on doing the more high detail things. So a lot of aesthetics and high detail. So within concrete 3D printing, you actually have two main strategies. One is what we call mono material printing. And two is what's often called two component material printing or accelerated printing. And the I first think it's one a K1 you take, and a K2 mix, right? Sure. Yeah. If yeah. you like, if you like, it's one component, two component, two right? Point. Um, K for component, not yes. so much in English, but in other languages. Yeah. Uh, so you have the one component, which is just your basic uh, powder material. You run through a pump, add water, and you print robot or gantry. The two component actually adds an accelerant at the nozzle to uh, harden the material within 30 seconds. So we are one of three companies in the world that um, four that have developed and sell this technology. And the main advantage of this technology is that it hardens the concrete so fast that you're able to produce extreme angles. So normal mono material is, you know, five, 10 degrees, but we can do 60 degrees. Ah. And our patterning is much more detailed because if you do that with a mono material, it falls down. So you need to accelerate really, really fast to make very beautiful designs. And so very you make the angles. K2 mix or the nozzle we, head? The mix and the nozzle. Oh, so yeah. the the first time I heard about this K1 and K2 mix was when I visited 20 Additive Manufacturing in Canada. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're great guys. I absolutely love them. Yeah. Such fun. Yeah, Ian's great. They're yeah. friends. So he was telling yeah. me about the, the nozzle head and he showed me the nozzle head that they had. Did they buy that from you? No, they bought that from a, a competitor in Austria called oh. Baumit. Okay. Yeah. So they use their, their, the machine from Austria. So there's three in the world robotics that do this one is Baumit in Austria one is X3 in France and we are the third okay um so the, the, the on the robotic side there's actually one also gantry producer which is Sika um but that's a whole nother a whole nother category so these we are basically the only three that do this and so within concrete printing in general we're actually the niche right so everybody's printing houses right now um, and we just, the ca it's so capital intensive that if I wanted to print a house here, the material for one house alone on the current, current prices on concrete, you're looking at 80, 90,000 euros of concrete alone. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense 
if you want to buy a house for 400,000 euros to have 90,000 euros of concrete, right? Just for your walls. Yeah. Right. But also I can't, I can't afford to try out 90,000 euros worth of house just to see if it works. Right. So it's a very capital intensive thing and we are much more focused on the design side. So um, yeah, the robotic side fits with that. The material side fits with that. So we develop our own material mix and our own nozzle. And they're now really focusing on being front runners in that niche. So is the mix still a motor mix, not concrete mix? Right. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So, I mean, you will know that concrete printing um, is generally mortar printing. Yeah. So smaller than three millimeter grain, um, which again is very good for the design side. And because it makes for smooth printing and not so great for the housing side because it's expensive. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So what about like dealing with compressive strength when you don't have any like aggregates in it? Yeah. Do so you all use fiber strength, reinforced? We don't, you don't need to. The compressive strength is still extremely high. So we're still looking at 50, 60 MPA because we use so much cement. And now that's an issue for sustainability. So there are many efforts right now to reduce the amount of cement in the concrete printing mix. Um, the reason why we don't do that yet is because um there are four elements to concrete printing material software robotics and pumping in my opinion um we are very good at the software and the robotic side we have partnered with a very good pump company and the material side is, is quite difficult and requires a lot of effort so we are waiting on other firms to produce this material and then we will buy it and use it for our technique okay. so it's not our main focus but there are many companies working on that right now so you um in the for the rest of this year and in the future too, you all want to focus on the software, the proprietary software that you've developed, and the nozzle head design too. That's right. Exactly right. Okay. So that is going to continue to improve, and we are working hard now with Sika to um, look at their material mix. They they have a very high detail, um, aesthetically pleasing mix as well. Um, and from a performance point of view, which was your question, they still perform extremely well, especially compared to traditional concretes because of the cement factor as well. And the compacting of the grain is very good for that. So adding larger aggregates doesn't necessarily mean you have better performance in the mix. It's just you use it for different applications, right? And in our case, we don't actually need the very high performance because what we often also do when we make constructive elements is we basically print the formwork, then we insert steel rebar, and then insert traditional concrete into that formwork, right? So we have a concrete column that we print, which is beautiful, and then we insert the rebar and the normal concrete. So you have a perfectly structural column that, that, that conforms to all norms because you're using traditional methods. We're just making a very nice mold around it as well and so saving a lot of wood waste. Okay, yeah. yeah. For the outer yeah. form work, I see. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you've been in the industry for quite a while now. You've seen it evolve from relatively, PLA. yeah. Relatively. How yeah. has it, has this innovation just accelerated over the last two years or so? Or it has been like a gradual? Yeah. No, it's been booming. So uh, I remember when I started, you know, we, there was nobody out there to copy. Right. There were some people that you could try to sort of look very closely at their LinkedIn posts and kind of see, you know, how did they how did they do this? And there were some academic articles which we studied in detail, but the amount of articles that are coming out now is it's impossible to follow. And I can't I used to be able to, you know, when we started name basically every company in the world that does concrete printing like this was maybe 20 companies that, that were doing this. And now it's easily over 100. So it's been booming significantly. And we also see this in the sales of our machines. So we actually sell the robots and the, the accelerated nozzle and also the mono nozzle because it's basically the same system without the specific nozzle on it, right? The basis is the same. And so it's like an add-on. You have one nozzle and then yes. add on something. Oh, that's smart. Instead of an entirely yeah. new nozzle. It, yeah, it's it, it basically, right? Because the nozzle for normal concrete printing is it's just a steel pipe it's very very simple right yeah. it's just the, it's just the hose and then a steel pipe so that it's not a flexible hose but a, a stiff thing so simple for us um, we add on an extra complex nozzle in order to mix and accelerate mix the concrete right before you pump it yeah 
Yeah. So that's more, it's, it's just more complex, which also makes it more expensive, but the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, design and, and, and print possibilities are, are much greater, right? So don't buy it. If you want to print a house, buy it. If you want to print architectural elements, uh, planters, furniture, you know, designer things that that's what it's used for. Okay. Um, but yeah, so the, the steel pipe alone is not, you know, it's not so difficult. It, it just does both. Yeah. So I was confused because before our call, I was going through your website and I thought you were going, your company was going down the route of actual product design and stuff. But it sounds like you're more interested in the technology side and the software side. Is it hard um, to capture that and put that on the website? Is that why you all have like the Voronoi wall and uh, <sighs> the turbines? So we do, we do both for several reasons. First of all, when we started, the, or when the company was started, when I started it, we wanted, to, I, I like, I really, really like 3D printing. Just, I really like just the technique. So we wanted to make stuff, but there's no market for, yeah. there was at least at the time, no market for, for 3D concrete printing things because nobody knew it existed, right? So you had to create the demand. So it was very important to create projects like the Voronoi wall. And that's one of the very earliest projects. And we can go into that a bit later. Um, what makes it interesting, but there just wasn't anything out there. So the way, um, especially in the beginning, the demand for machinery suddenly skyrocketed, right? Everybody wants to have one of these machines. So we started to sell our machines and it, it turns out we were good at good making at and that. selling machines. So we sell more and more machines, but so for a while I struggled to think, okay, so are we going onto the machine sales side or the production side? And I quickly came to realize that in an innovation stage in I think any technology, it's you you cannot do one or the other. Mm. You have to do both. Because if you're not making anything, you don't know Learn what from, the machine yeah. needs to change, right? You don't know what to change on the machine. So our machine is quite um I, I think very advanced because we make these projects as well. Right. So we're continuously improving the machine because we know what it, we want it to do. And so I will continue to do this, continue to do um, projects that are a bit, you know, the more difficult, more high scale projects. And at the same time, which improves the robustness and the capabilities of our machine. So the Voronoi wall, you, that was one of your earliest projects? Yes. So this is a typical example of the co cooperation with the university. Um, they had done a concrete printing project, but in the end had not printed the wall. And I said, I'll, you know, I'll do it for you because I need to get printing experience. And at the time we had developed our own material. And when you, the early materials, um, all of them stack about 30, 40 centimeters before collapsing, right? So first you have to figure out how do you make the concrete stand up? And you, that's now we all know it's by adding a viscosity modifying agent and it stands up, but it only stands up 30, 40 centimeters. So that's what we could do. And now the Voronoi wall is a super simple project because it only has every shape only has four or five coordinates um, and repeated in layers that go up. And it's only about 30 centimeters high, 20 to 30. So the material could handle it. The coding was relatively simple, but when put together, it looks still looks kind of nice and, and you know, it, it fun and impressive. But the technology is so simple that um, at the time that anybody could make this wall still. You don't need the super expensive machine. You can make a um, mix. Our mix is open source. You could still use it and make this wall with a simple robot and a simple pump. So each so of those components nice was separate and then you assembled it on site? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Ah, and yeah. how did you deal with yeah. the spacing in between? Uh, the grouting. So we didn't do it. Actually, the university was in the, in the lead on that. But you, you can set them on top of each other. You can either put grouting in the middle or, or you can put filt in the middle or nothing at all because they're very strong, the elements, right? It's, yeah. it, it's still concrete and still quite thick. Um, so an element that thick will actually stay standing by itself on top of each other quite well. So another one of your projects is printing on Mars, which is extremely yeah. popular right now. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into that? Was it a competition? No, we um, uh, we were asked by the TU Delft to join in because, um, first of all, you know, it's a small country. We know each other and I know some people that were doing PhD at Delft and uh, they were doing a Mars project. And I actually was never into printing stuff for Mars because I think it's quite, you know, far away and it's not, you know, it's not in, mm, not very practical. 
um, but we were asked to print these designs for them. And we, we thought, you know, it's still, an, it's nice to be involved with the university. It's a very good university and it's a nice project also for the European Space Agency. So we became involved. And the great thing about the project is within a few weeks, um, we had printed their first designs. And one of the things they did on Mars, you have to think in a completely different set of rules, which is really fun. Um, they have heat issues. And so the painting pattern they do is they create a lot of surface area so that you have a lot of heat dissipation, right? The same way you have a, a, a car engine or a motor, it has a lot of surface area to dissipate the heat. And I thought that's cool because that's something that's really good to do with the 3D printing, right? In plastics, but also in, in concrete. And about a week later, a client came to us and said, we have some issues um, on the railways with our electrical boxes that there's a lot of heat generated in the summer. Could you 3D print something? And I thought, hey, we had this great example three weeks earlier of how to dissipate heat with a pattern. So uh, immediately my thoughts of, you know, Mars isn't, it's not very useful to think about it. We're, you know, negated oh, in that we immediately had a lesson learned from the project on what we could do practically now here on earth as well. So that's the fun thing about that project is that um, it's, it's quite high level, of course, because it's quite far away, but the lessons can be translated pretty quickly back to, to earth. That's so fascinating. That cool. Yeah, because yeah. I was going through the description and it said, like, we have to think about subterranean um, yeah. habitats because of radiation and heat. Mm. But then the sculpt sculptures that you all printed look like they were towers. So I was going to ask you about that. How, why is that? That's also interesting. But again, you know, I could talk an hour about this. Yeah. Um, what they actually decided, and I thought it was really smart because I never thought about it, and you have the radiation issues and whatnot, and they, they wanted to build their habitat inside um, uh, inactive lava tubes. So apparently on Mars, there's very large lava tubes that are, that are empty spaces, cavernous. And if you would insert a robot into one of these caverns, then you, you could scan the, the wall and the shapes that the voids that are left, you could print inside the voids. Um, but the way you want to do that is with a special um, shape that optimizes structurally. And if you look carefully, the shapes on the Mars objects are also Voronoi. Just like the wall we talked about earlier, the shapes for the Mars objects are also Voronoi, which if you Wikipedia, you'll see is an optimization strategy for structural behavior as well. So it's all, it's all connected, right? Because quick side note, one of the interesting things about concrete printing is that you're so form free that you can optimize this type of structural behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm really into that, not only to make nice things, but to think about the architectural side and what are the actual conceptual advantages, um, like the bridge we did. But so you see these Voronoi shapes have to be inserted in these voids in the lava tubes. And that's why you have these sort of tower shapes, because they're all going to be different, right? They're not ah. just printed on, on top of the earth. So it's so it's next what, level but yeah. it's very interesting <laughs> so what material did they propose printing with on mars the local so soil yes so they call it regolith um and this is not my area of expertise but they, they refer to it as mars regolith so we actually ordered a set uh, or a, a uh, sample of Mar simulated mars regolith from the usa which is extremely expensive per kilo uh, but we actually tried to print that um, in uh, in our machine, which was successful. So the shapes you see are still printed with our concrete. But in the meantime, we've also done actual simulations of the Mars regolith. Um, and again, it's their project. I don't know how yeah. much they've published about it already. So I, I, I can't maybe not go into too much detail, but we've actually done uh, simulated Mars material prints as well so the last question about this project is just because i'm fascinated sure. with it yeah apparently <laughs> so <laughs> instead of water do they propose mixing the powder with sulfur or something uh that um that i don't know no um okay. so it's that's too much into the detail because yeah. there's a big discussion inside on the material side how yeah. that you know what the advantages and disadvantages are and i know it's a whole discussion so um, I don't know the details of how they're going to solidify the, the actual printed material. Yeah, I don't know. Because there is a company in the States that claiming to print these structures on Mars. And it's like, it, to me, it just looks like red pigmented concrete. Mm. So right. I don't know how they're simulating 
conditions on Mars when they're printing those structures. But it sounds like it's an ongoing research and they're still trying to figure this out. It, it, it serves, serves to prove my point that, you know, material research is hard. Yeah. Like it's, you can't just, you know, just do it. it there's a, it's a whole thing, you know, you have to read. Yeah. So it's not my area of expertise. And I have a lot of respect for people that figure out, you like know, talking exactly to the you, behavior of these things. Sorry, talking to you, it feels yeah. like your, your tone because you have so much passion for the design side, <laughs> and the yeah, ar yeah. architecture side, but you're also really good at selling machines. And so mm. what, what do you, do you have any other design projects scheduled for the rest of this year? Uh, yes. Right now we were uh, printing some uh, furniture for a museum here in, uh, in the Netherlands, which is nice as part of a renovation project. Um, but we have some more and more um, demand for facade panels. And um, so these designs that, you know, the Voronoi or, or whatnot, these are all part of what's called parametric design. So we use the same software that we use to translate to our robot code. We can also use to design parametrically. So it's more a visual coding thing where we can, you know, adjust some numbers and the design comes out. Um, so we can create a lot of variation and that's going to be interesting for facade panels. So there's a lot of demand for facade panels right now. There's a couple of um, projects that we're talking to for larger facade um, uh, installations. And at the same time, there's a very large demand for um, uh, ornaments and garden furniture, plants, planters, pots, because the aesthetic and the material is so interesting. And that's something we're launching in about a month. So, you know, watch our site. You'll see our new line of products being launched in about a month or so. Um, so, so there's demand on that side too. So for printing, we're doing a lot of that stuff and a lot of demand for facade. Um, and would elements. you be shipping all these planters and garden furniture out to customers? So my strategy, my opinion of how uh, 3D concrete printing, uh, how we can sell it is that the machine market is international. So in Holland, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have four commercial partners and two universities doing it. So it's saturated. So the machine sales market is international, but the product market is local because why ship end products to Australia if you can also produce them locally with the machine sale? So our focus for the market for actual production is the Netherlands, Germany, France, Belgium, Luxembourg. That's where you see demand. And shipping stuff to, to uh, United States, for example, is something that's going to happen later. Um, so what we see more is that we are we recently sold a machine to a partner in Florida and they will be producing similar objects, right? So instead of us shipping stuff, we would partner with them to produce our designs and sell locally, um, which is much more logistically, you know, it makes yeah. logistically it makes a lot more sense. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. of all the projects you printed, what's your favorite? Is it? The Voronoi wall, is it the wind turbines, the floating wind turbines? I, I think there's two that I that I really like. The first is we have, um, we printed a concrete canoe. Um, and the reason why I think it's probably my favorite is because it's my first project. And so um, when I printed it, I didn't know how to operate the um, robot. And I also didn't really know how to um, operate a continuous mix um concrete pump so we'd figured out the basics and we were able to do some stuff um but printing that that uh that canoe was like a pressure cooker um which i only you know put on myself so i was like the only one inside this pressure cooker having to figure out how to do all of this by myself and i worked with a university and a bunch of students who did this race every year called the concrete canoe race in which you have to build a canoe out of concrete in whichever fashion you please within a set of rules and obviously we were going to 3D print it. And what we ended up ma making was a beast of a machine. Uh, it was 450 kilo boat. And it was really exciting for us to see if it would actually work. And after months of failures, uh, the about four days before the race, we finally managed to print one. Then it took us two days to move it five meters onto the truck because I was so scared it would break. And in the end, when we flipped the canoe into the water and it floated, it, I, we were just ecstatic so it was really a proof of concept of you know the whole 
labor that we've been uh, we've been working on. So that's probably my favorite project because it was you know my first. Um, but I also really like the the topology optimized bridge which we did with the University of Ghent, which really showcases the um, what I'd explained earlier is the you know the the potential to really use the philosophy of structural engineering. So this bridge is designed. Um, not by by hand, but by the computer. It takes a block and it will remove material until it has a optimal shape. And this speaks to material reduction, sustainability, form freedom, all things that are really well suited for 3D printing of concrete. And the stuff we've seen right now in 3D printing of concrete in the world hasn't been using this technique optimally. So that bridge is a really good example of what you can actually do if you focus on the potential of structural engineering as well. And there's a few universities doing some th things in this area, but I think that's really good. Hopefully that's really going to take off more in the next years. That's interesting. So you're saying that rather than just printing straight walls, we can actually build walls that use less material and only use material where needed. Absolutely. Yeah. Because once you look at that bridge and you can imagine, imagine the bridge being solid, Right. And now imagine how much material you've just removed that wasn't serving any function at all in your bridge. Now, when you look at your own walls in your house, it scares you to know that most of it's in the in the middle doesn't do anything. It's just it's just there because we don't like to have a hole in our wall. And it's there to you know keep the wind out, keep the water out and keep the, um, the heat in. Um, but it's not performing a structural function. So if you could remove half the wall and fill it with materials that perform these functions better, suddenly you're minimizing material and improving the function of your house. And these type of things are interesting to, you know, sort of what we learned from the Mars projects too, right? They're quite out there, but that's where we want to be going eventually. So how do you use that knowledge you've gained in the housing market, I know you all don't want to enter that, but there's yeah. so it's a completely different type of thinking that is really needed in residential construction. Agreed, uh, I agreed, and honestly, um, I don't see that as our purpose. Um, so it's too much to take on, right? It's the scale that we have as a company as well. We can't compete. Uh, you know, there's a company in the USA called Icon which you will know, um, you know, in the USA, they, they get funding of $208 million or something of the sort. You can do whatever you like with that kind of money, right? It's not how it works here. So we're, we have to focus more on, on the, um, the potential of the specific thing and make examples and then hope that translates into the construction industry. For me to take on the construction industry, it's, 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 it's just too much, right? There's, you will lose focus and therefore, in my opinion, not be effective. So it's something I can't take on, sadly, yeah. at the moment. Yeah, but I, I know the money is much needed, but the scarcity of money has made you all far more creative. Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perhaps. I mean, yeah. compared to like, um, um, so when I compare myself to the concrete printing companies that have started from a, construction firm they spend a lot of money in early whereas we had to bootstrap a lot right um, which meant that we've done it very lean um, but are also uh, we, we, we also have much less pressure to have a return on investment on the first few years of our development so the, many of the companies that have just built giant things they have to start generating return on investment whereas we're still lean and doing the projects we want in order to show what's possible and developing the technology to be better and better and better because that's what's generating our income that's what's generating our sales so that difference you do see when it comes to how you fund you know an innovation which which in the end makes us more creative as you say potentially yeah. well it was really really good chatting with you Volker. thank yeah. you and i'm gonna keep checking out your website for all the new products sure. that you mentioned um and hope to catch up with you soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. It's uh, been nice to chat with you. And, and I hope that your viewers have questions maybe that in the comments we'll be able to pick up on. Absolutely. Yes.
right. and if Thank you're interested in um, the technology itself obviously feel free to reach out for a quote or a request if i may be so free to mention that here as well absolutely how would they reach out to you the the website's easiest info at vertigo3d.com in the mail if you like and um, maybe we can put it in the comments section um, for anybody that that wants to know yes absolutely thank you so Perfect. much Volker. thank you so vertigo according to their website seems like they do a wide variety of different projects I was very surprised when I started talking to Volker because before the interview, I went to their website and I started looking up everything that they had done. And I thought they were actually printing projects like the Voronoi wall and some water features for a school. But when I talked to him, he they are more in they are more specialized in selling machines, selling nozzle heads, selling the motor mixes. He is very passionate about the design side and it's fascinating talking to him because he, he has a, a degree in philosophy and he, he has no experience in architecture. He has no degree in architecture, but he has such appreciation for it. It's so wonderful to talk to someone like that who understands it at a different level and they, the way they talk about it is so beautiful. Usually the best students that come out of architecture school are the with their masters are the ones that did their undergrad and something else. And they have that, that business mind or that philosophy mind or that engineering mind. And then they get that little bit of architecture they need that design. And then they come out at the end and they're more well-rounded. It's a, that's a very good point because you really don't need both a bachelor's and master's in architecture. You don't learn much more in, in your, in graduate school. It's kind of like taking a pre-law degree. Why is that? Because it's pointless. You don't need a pre-law degree to practice law. Okay. <laughs> what about a pre-med degree? I don't know about that. That's outside of my field of expertise, but apparently law is in my field. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, balancing a business mind with a design mind or philosophy mind with a design mind creates a different kind of person. So Vertigo is one of those companies that could be lumped in with the exploratory and design 3D printing companies that sells the nozzle head. I mean, they're technical and they do the design part, but at a small scale. It seems like Volker doesn't really care to expand to uh, like building houses or something like that. He says, leave that to the people that are able to get the money in the States. That's a common uh not complain, but common thought. Whenever I talk to people in Europe, they always say, oh, you people can get so much funding in the States. It, money doesn't isn't thrown around in the in Europe like, like it's thrown around in the States or in California. I believe them. I mean, after seeing what uh, Black Buffalo and what Icon... Mighty Buildings. Mighty Buildings, all these companies have raised, it's crazy. I feel like 3D printing companies are able to raise more money because they straddle this weird in-between world of technology and construction that hasn't really been seen before. Yeah, and you mentioned it last week that there it's this whole new field, uh, 3D printing, and it's creating all these new opportunities. And I guess you mentioned that a couple of weeks ago about how money is going to be pumped into these new construction technology companies as it the same way it was pumped into app developing companies in the late 90s and early 2000s. So as architects or designers, I think the one thing about 3D printing that really excites us is its design capabilities. It's not just because right now it's using traditional materials. So what we can do with the machine is what's exciting, what's different, at least to me. So. I think in the 80s or 90s, Gehry Technologies, Frank, Frank Gehry's um, company, developed this new software called Katia because they had such complex projects. There was no software out there that could decipher it and turn all these complex projects and facades into realistic drawings. And so they had to develop their new software. Yeah, architects like Zaha Hadid push what is called parametric design. So what is parametric design? We did it 
all of us did in school. It's interesting. Whenever we got into architecture school, I'm sure it would have been very different taking, uh, doing architecture 10 years earlier. Same as the way it is now. I'm sure it's very different. But this parametric design, what the software could do, programming to help develop your building design uh, really started to evolve into something. Like before, it was just simple, straight, clean lines, everything. It was dictated by the designer. Or dictated by the software, like the capabilities of the software. Like you said with Gary, they had to come up with their own software to be able to handle these complex shapes. Well, with parametric design, you're able to explore new shapes that you didn't know were possible by inputting this information into code and allowing that to not design your building, but give you ideas. So it's a really good definition. It's exactly what you said. It's a design, parametric design is a design method where features are shaped according to algorithmic processes in contrast to being designed directly. So you create a, a formula and then you allow the formula to run and create these shapes that you hadn't thought of or hadn't, or you would have to manually design. Unfortunately, I'm sure it's different now, but in architecture school for us, parametric modeling or parametric design was so new that we were literally just exploring what it could do. There weren't, there wasn't much reason behind it. And I think hopefully that's what we're getting to now is where this parametric design is used with logic and reasoning, and it helps us come up with more efficient uh, shapes. It's not form for the sake of form. There, are, For example, we're not just designing a funky wall for the sake of it. We're using parametric design to create a wall that uses 50% less material or is far more energy efficient or resource efficient. There are, there's an underlying, strong underlying reason to that wall. So that's similar to the bridge that Volker and his team designed, where they actually took out as much extraneous material as possible. In yeah, order I think to, they call it a top topology optimized bridge. That beckons back to modernist architects like my favorite Le Corbusier, who would uh, keep everything minimal and cut it down to the essence, no extra ornament. And you're seeing that used in parametric design. I don't know if you should mention Le Corbusier again. I got some hate on Twitter because you had a Le Corbusier up, book up there. Yeah, I didn't understand that. He's a controversial figure. He is? Apparently. So is Louis Kahn. So is everyone. But he, uh, he designs beautiful buildings or design beautiful buildings. All right, so should we do it? Talk about Mars habitats? What is there to talk about? It's all hypothetical, funky designs with uh, red pigmented concrete. So we can't talk about Mars habitats without, again, talking about the TV show The Expanse. And it was really interesting to see how they designed all their habitats to be underground, which is very realistic because of the elements on Mars, you wouldn't be able to build a habitat above ground and go outside. So why not build underground? And that's kind of what uh, Volker's idea was. Yeah, I, I get it from that sense. But when we see other companies printing all these red pigmented structures and saying that's what Mars habitats would be like, I'm like where are you printing that? Are you creating this giant cave underground in on Mars and that's where your 3D printer is going to be? And, and you're printing underground because you can't print on the surface. I thought their idea of building within these, was it um, inactive volcanic structures, well, was kind of interesting. It seems kind of realistic. The one thing that I really appreciated about the Amman's project was how they applied what they learned to problems here on Earth. He talked about creating these heat dissipating structures on Mars. And then a week later, a month later, someone talked to, someone approached him with that problem. And he was able to use those lessons learned for that new project. Now that makes sense to me. It's similar to what we've done on the space station and the experiments we conduct 
we conduct i say like actually i'm actually contributing to that the experiments that uh, astronauts conduct out on the international space station and all that knowledge gained is converted or trickles down to consumer grade products that we use and that we don't even realize we don't even appreciate there's so many things in our home that can be traced back to space exploration made a video on that too and maybe that's where we're going with 3d printing in this technology that everyone's trying to explore uh, we have these companies building throwing up all these houses all over the states and maybe we'll learn some lessons from those houses and it will help in the mass production of homes in the future not saying that we're just going to 3d print all the homes but at least we're using some part of that technology or maybe it's a new material that is created through the use of hemp that allows us to make more efficient more sustainable homes that's a good point because like if you think about wood construction it is cheap easy to build there was there was no hurdle in wood construction that made us think differently that's why we've been building the same for so many decades but with 3d printing it's not really sustainable it's using a high amount of cement and mortar which is not good for the environment and we cannot continue this for several decades we need to rethink the way 3d printing is done we need to use different materials we need to use different forms so we this we have this new technology but it is not sustainable in the long, long run so we are already trying to think of different ways to make it better it's basically a form of automation that we're trying to make work for the construction industry the material is not great right now the way it's done how it's just printing a wall is not ideal but it will lead to something better as long as there's companies out there like Vertigo and Saga and 20 Additive Manufacturing that are exploring the ways this machine can be used. So I hope you enjoyed that discussion on 3D concrete printing. I'll provide a link to Vertigo's website in the description. Let us know what other topics you'd like us to explore and join us next week for another episode on building science, products and technology.